Jag heter Mika, jag bor i Helsingfors, jag är 46 år gammal. And that's all the Swedish I know, yes. So, um, yeah, my name is Mika and um, I have a wife named Rami. And I have four children. Uh, my children's ages are 21, 19, 16 and 14. If any of you are looking for a great spouse, we can talk after this service. My children are dedicated followers of Jesus Christ. They're serious about reaching the world. So if that's you and you're the partner, come and talk to me afterwards the service. Okay, they would hate. Uh, what's that? Yeah, we can arrange something, yes. And they would hate that I just told that to you. But, uh, but, but it's okay, it's okay. We can, we can still arrange, yeah. I believe in arranged marriages. <laughs> they are from God, they are biblical, they are completely fantastic, and, uh, and yes, so we can talk afterwards. I have, like I said, I have four children, and so people, I, I, um, I, w I was a missionary, and I was a missionary kid in Indonesia. I was brought up there, and in Indonesia, they have this policy, two-child policy, where you should only have two children, and they say, dua anak cukup, two kids are enough. And, and uh, so I, when we went there as a family, and I had four children, they were like, wow, you got a big family. Man, you must really love children. And I would always answer, nah. I mean, they're okay. I mean, they're my kids. I, of course, I love them. But it's not, not. So, so what's the, what, so why do you have four, four children? So I, I really love my wife. <laughs> if you did not get that, you need to talk to Eric afterwards. And he will explain to you about the birds and the bees at the end of this service as well. Fantastic. If you have your Bibles, I'm going to be speaking from Philippians chapter 1, verse 3 to 14. Philippians chapter 1, from verse 3 to 14. So this is where you can put the, the airline mode on and get your handheld phones, and you can see there, or you can also probably follow from the, the screen. And I'll be reading this in English because, um, did you know, by the way, when we get to heaven, we will all speak Finnish? Did you know that? You didn't know that? It's in the Bible. It's in my Bible. It says there. When, you know, they had, the disciples were all asking like, oh, what's the question? What, what, what language are we speaking in, fin, in, in, in heaven? And, 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 you know, and they, they finally, Jesus decided it. It was his last words on earth. He said, it is finished. <laughs> Kaboom. And if your Bible doesn't say that, <laughs> you have the wrong translation. <laughs> All right, Philippians chapter 1, verse 3. <laughs> In my previous life, I was a stand-up comedian. And uh, yes, I'm still trying to get rid of that side of my life. Thanksgiving and prayer. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart, and whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace God and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more proclaim the gospel without fear. Shall we pray together? Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask that in the next few moments you would speak to us. Lord, I pray that we could all say, God, if you're there, would you speak to me? 
would you speak to each person in this room? Speak through your word. Father, it might be one sentence, one thought. It might be the whole thing, whatever it is. It might be just the scripture and the verses that we just read. Whatever it is, I just pray, Lord, that you will speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you noticed that different people face the exact same thing differently? Two different people looking at the same thing will look at it completely differently. Some, somebody will say, oh, that's great. Somebody will say, oh, that's ugly. Somebody will say, and they're looking at the same thing. And it's also the same situation with our situations that we face in life. The situations that come up, you know, we, we kind of face them differently. We, we have this, you know, and, and the other person would face it in a completely different way. Um, like I said, I have four children. Two of the oldest children, Hannah is 21, just to let you know, guys. And uh, Isaiah, he's 19, and he's doing his military service. He's really handsome, looks like his dad, just to let you know, girls. And... Nobody laughed at that one, it's okay. <laughs> and, and, um, but they have completely different temperaments. They have completely different ways of looking at, 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 at life. Hannah is more introspective and, 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 and emotional. And, and Isaiah is, is, I mean, he's like the, the social guy. He comes to a place and he says, what's up everybody? You know, and, and he's just like me, you know, just like me. He's so good with people and, and, and he just, you know, loves Jesus and, 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 and he's good looking and, uh, did I say that already? You know, he's so much, you know, li like me. And, and Hannah is more like her mom. <laughs> no, it's actually not true. My, my, my wife is really, really outgoing as well. So, and I, I guess I have sometimes this tendency because after all, I'm a Finn. So, you know, we tend to kind of be gloomy at times and, you know, and say we're never going to win Sweden in the ice hockey. We're never going, you know, we, we have this tendency of, of looking down on ourselves. But, but, uh, but you know, we, we were living in Australia and uh, for a few years. I was pastoring a small church there, an international church there. And, and we were driving on a, on a trip from, from north, from Brisbane down to Canberra where we were living. And on the way, the police called us and asked um, are you guys home? And we said, no, we're not home. My wife had a, you know, had a sick spell last night, so we had to spend a night at a hotel. Why? What's up? And the police says, well, that's really good because your house is on fire. And 80% of your house has already been destroyed, and we have not been able to put out the fire. So that really put a gratefulness into our lives that my wife had had an allergic reaction last night and we had had to spend the night in a hotel on the way. We lost everything. We drove the last three hours to our home, our house, and we were looking at our burnt house and, and I was trying to comfort Hannah who was 12 years at that time and, and I put my hand over her. She was feeling somehow like you know this was her fault. The fire had started from her room. One of the heaters had gone on when it was not supposed to go on and and it had started there and caught on fire and it was black ash and black smoke and and they had seen the black smoke and when the fire department had gone in they had opened the door and it had gone kaboom you know the house had exploded and 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 and, and everything and she was looking at her room that was destroyed completely 100 percent and he was looking and she was crying and crying and crying and and looking at that you know that all her memories are gone Everything, her, her childhood book, you know, my wife had been so good at keeping like locks of hair from their, in, the, in their baby books and the picture and everything was destroyed and she was feeling so emotional and I was trying to comfort her and, and while I'm comforting her, I look at my other side and my son who's 10 years old, Isaiah is standing on the other side and he has this big smile on his face, you know, it's, That's when I got really worried. <laughs> and so I let my daughter go for a moment and I went and I put my hand over my son's shoulder and I said, Isaiah, what's, what's going on? And he was looking at the, at the remainder of our home and his room that completely destroyed and, and, and he had this big smile on his face and it, Isaiah, what's going on in your head? And he had this even, his smile got even bigger. And, and then I l looked at him and I, I tried to look at the building and I said, what, what's so funny there? And I said, Isaiah, what are you looking at? What are you seeing? 
And my son looks, he says, Dad, I see new clothes. I see new clothes. Same parents, two different children, completely different. Same DNA, same parents. At least I'm 99.9% .9 sure that they're the same parents. Completely different in their way how they're looking at a same situation. Our lives, we tend to look at things differently. And you know the truth that you, I need you to hear tonight is that you are not able to decide what you are going to face in your life, but you can decide how you're going to face the situations in your life. Now that's good. If I was you, I would be putting that with my thumbs into the phone. You cannot decide what you're going to face in life but you can decide how you're going to face it. Apostle Paul was writing in a prison. He had been in prison for a couple of years. He, was, he, was, uh, uh, he, he had been in a Roman prison, and he's writing to a church that he, he, he had kind of been helping founding that church. You know, the church in Philippi, you go to the book of Acts and you can read about that church there, how, how it got started, and, and he felt compassion and passion for them. And, and he was writing from prison to show us that actually we can decide what kind of an attitude we'll have. And I'll just point out three things in these scriptures that Paul is facing with a different attitude that probably you and I would not have had. But see, Paul had understood that if you have the right attitude, everybody say attitude. Okay, you sound like Swedish. Can you say it like English people, you know, attitude. Okay, now say it like Swedish, attitude. Yeah, there you go. You, you, you know what attitude means, right? You, you know what attitude is, right? The, the difference. If you have the right attitude, you can see that every obstacle is a possibility. Every difficulty is a possibility. Every storm has a purpose why God has allowed it in your heart. But only if you have the right attitude. If you don't have the right attitude, you're going to say, oh, that's so high. Oh, my goodness. That, 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 that the obstacle is so high. I, I, I can never do that. I wonder why it's in my life. In Jesus' name, I want it to go away. This, this obstacle is too much. But if you have the right attitude, you can look at the obstacle and say, once I get up on there, I'm going to see the world in a different light. I can see differently what's happening around me. I can see the people in the room in a little bit different way because I have this obstacle that I've had to climb up to get up there. Attitude is crucial to you. You cannot decide what is going to happen, but you can decide how you're going to respond to what is going to happen. The three areas that Paul is speaking here about that I want to highlight, he speaks, the book of Philippians is a fantastic book. I mean, when you're imagining that this is the letter that he wrote from a Roman prison to a church, and, and this is the letter that he, you know, he had been in the prison for a year and a half at this point, and this is the letter where he says, rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say rejoice. You guys need to have a little bit more smile on your face. You guys, and this is a guy speaking and writing from a prison. He's writing from a prison and saying, you guys need to have a little bit joy in your life. You guys are lacking a little bit in your joy in, 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 in Stockholm, in Philadelphia. You guys need a little bit more joy, a little bit more smile on your face. You guys need to change your attitude. Change your attitude. Fix your attitude. Now, you do know that right now I'm speaking to your neighbor, right? Your neighbor needs to fix his attitude. So would you just let your neighbor know that he's preaching to you tonight? You know, so pay attention. Tell your neighbor he's preaching to you. He's preaching to you. Come on in the back as well. Tell your neighbor he's preaching to you. You know, people think that just because I'm 46, I cannot see what's happening in the back. I see it. I see you. I can see the glow of that Facebook page on your... 
three areas that I want to highlight. The first one, the attitude that, that Paul mentions here, is the attitude towards people. Attitude towards people. And you can write this down. What's my attitude to people? People. What is the attitude towards people? I don't know if you've realized how many of you are under 30 years of age. Put your hands up if you're under 30 years of age. All right. If you're under 30 and you're single, keep your hands up. Put your hands up. Look around. This is the night of possibilities, people. If you have not yet noticed, you will notice once you hit 30 that there are some people that are difficult. Some people are just difficult people. There are just some people. If you don't believe me, become a pastor. Then you'll learn that there are some really difficult people. Can I say amen? Hear an amen? Amen. Amen. Yes. Yes. Amen. There are just people who are just difficult. I mean, I don't know what's wrong with them. I don't know why God created them. They're just difficult people. It, it's, it seems like you can never do anything right for some people. People are, are, they're filled with problems. Some of them have problems from their childhood. And, 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 and so th there are people with lots of difficulties in their life. And some people just are difficult. Paul writes to the difficult people when he's thinking about the people in Philippi. And tell, let me tell you, there were some difficult people in Philippi. You might think that they were all saints. They weren't. They were just like Stockholm, Philadelphia, <laughs> filled with difficult people. I've been talking to your pastors today. I know about you. I know how difficult the people are here. Philippi was just like your church. It was full of difficult people. You know, the, 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 the people that when you see them sitting somewhere, you got like go from the other door just because you just want to run into them, you know, because they're strange or they're difficult. Or, or you. If you ever come to our church in Helsinki, in Helsinki for Salem, you will see that there is a section of the church that is a bit empty. And it's not because the other seats are more comfortable. No. It's because there is one difficult person who always sits in that spot. So everybody from around her has disappeared and they have found the rest of the church much more agreeable to their taste. You know, because... because Oh, I'm not preaching about her. I'm preaching about Jesus. But just to let you know that there are difficult people in the church. And you can say amen to that, you know. Uh, there are difficult people. If, if you don't know about difficulties, trust me, it's, it's coming. <laughs> difficult people are just around the corner waiting to help you grow in the character of Christ. To become more like Jesus. Paul, when he's writing to the church in Philippi, he says... Every time I think of you, I get happy. I get happy. I mean, there's just this smile on my face. Every time I start praying for you, it's just like this boom starts bubbling up from there. And it was not because they were great people. It was because he had a different attitude towards people. Every time I think of you, I get happy. I hope you have these kinds of people in your life. That whenever you think of them, they make you happy. If you're married, I hope it's your spouse. If you're not married, I hope it's your future spouse. Every time you think of them, it makes you happy. But see, there's a secret to this. That it is possible that you can actually be happy thinking about almost anybody. Almost anybody. I, I could almost say that you can, you can be happy thinking about just about anybody. You can get a joy when you think of them. And Paul gives the secret why you can be happy. He says this. See, he who began a good work in you, he's going to complete it. So that's why I can be happy today. You know, God started a good work in Eric. And even though he's not 
perfect. You, know, you and I know it. You know, we can just be honest about it. He's, he's not perfect, you know. But God has started a good work in him. So I can be happy about what it's going to be, how perfect he's going to be, because this is what makes me really happy. Whatever God starts, he always finishes. Ooh. Whatever God starts, he always finishes. Whatever work that God has started in your spouse, in your neighbor, in your neighborhood, whatever work that God has started in that difficult person, you can start being happy today because he who began a good work in you is going to see it through. God never does anything halfway. He never says, ah, you know what, that just person is just too difficult for me. Can you imagine if God did that? I'm sorry. Stefan is just too difficult for me. I can't. He never does that. He said, I've started a good work. I'm going to finish it. I'm going to finish it. And that's why every time I pray for you, it's just something starts coming up from there. I know that the church in Philadelphia is not perfect, but every time I think of them, you know, just something just happens. You know, I know they are some difficult people. You know, my parents, they are difficult people, but I know that God has started something in them. And I want you to pay great, uh, careful attention in the coming weeks and coming months to see the people that you said were kind of difficult, the people that you said that, I wish I don't have to sit next to them. The people that you said, you know, I'll go, you know, if they're going for coffee now right after, I'm just going to wait and hang around with the cool people. And then after they're done with their coffee, then I'm going to go for coffee. Those people, pay careful attention to them and see if God has started doing even something small in them. Even just something small in them. Start putting a smile on your face. Wow. God's going to make something great in their life. Wow. God's going to do something awesome in their life. I'm going to start thanking him already because he who began a good work in me, he who began a good work in him, he who began a good work in her, he is going to see it through because my God never leaves anything unfinished. Somebody could say amen. If this was a Pentecostal church, I mean, you could say amen. But if it's not, then don't worry about it. Let's go to second point. You, you, you know, if you want to, you can say amen. But it's good to find the right places where to say amen. Because sometimes, especially if you're hesitant with the language or where the sermon is going, you might just say amen in the wrong spot, like, you know, you know, Pastor Eric is difficult. Amen! Oh, no, no, not that part, you know. So wait for the good part. But I usually pause for those parts, and that's when it's your turn, and you can say, amen, yes. Or, or I have a little bit of black inside of me, so I really respond well when people start saying, like, preach it, brother, preach it. You know, that's, that's oh, I feel at home, man. I, 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 I am, yeah, thank you. I, I'm just, I'm, I'm just a... I am just a black man trapped in a white man's body. That's what I am. All right. The second thing that Paul says that we should watch our attitude in is circumstances. 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 People. And the second thing is circumstances. Verses 12 to 14. Paul is writing from a prison cell. He's been there for a year and a half, and he has only heard once in a year and a half from the church in Philippi. And he's saying, you know what? If I, let's just put it this way, I'll become more personal. If I had been in a Roman prison for a year and a half, and I'm writing a letter to the Chara Bruder Sister E. Stockholm, Philadelphia. I think my letter would have sounded something like this. I have been here now for one and a half years, trapped in this cell, and there's only one place where light comes in, 
and it's in the roof. I'm being held below ground in this Roman dungeon. And it feels like God has forgotten me. And it sure feels like you guys in Stockholm have forgotten me. The only thing I got was when you sent me some, a blanket last year. <laughs> you don't understand how cold this is in the winter and how steaming hot this gets in the summer. You guys have no idea how bad it is here for me. For one and a half years, I have been in chains. There has been a chain shackled to my wrist for one and a half years, and it's bleeding if I move my hand too much because of the, of the, of the tension that it is kept in there. And worse still, this, this, this shackle is, is chained to my guard that's on the other side, and there's about a foot length, and this guard has the other end of the chain shackled to him. And every six hours, they come and they change the guard on the other side, but there's always somebody next to me. I'm trying to have conversation and pray with God, and, and, and these guys are disturbing me, and they're the problem in my life. I, when I go to the bathroom, these guys come with me to the bathroom. When I go to sleep, these guys lay down next to me. These big, hairy Roman soldiers lay down next to me. I am scared, too scared to sleep, but I cannot stay awake. This is terrible, and it seems like you guys have forgotten me. Sincerely, your servant, Mikaviriola, Rome. <laughs> that would have been close to what my letter was, but that was not even close to the letter that Paul sent to the church in Philippi. Why? Because he had a different attitude. He wrote like this. Hmm. Guys, you don't know how great this is. When I pray, these guys can't run away. They hear every conversation that I have with God and with the visitors in my place. And you know what? After I've talked to them for six hours and I've really poured salt of the gospel on them, you know what they do? After six hours, they bring fresh meat. <laughs> and these guards cannot run away from me because they're chained to me. That was Paul's attitude. And then later on he says that actually some people in the Caesar's household, in the emperor's household, those were the guards, they have become believers. Why? Because they were chained to the apostle Paul who didn't let the circumstance dictate his attitude. But his attitude dictated what he was going to do in circumstance. He had like different glasses on. He was like looking at this situation completely from a different perspective. I would have said, these guys never leave me alone. And he said like, these guys never leave me alone. You notice the slight difference there? <laughs> these guys never leave me alone. These guys can't run away from me. What a different attitude. Same circumstance, you're just looking at it completely differently. I wonder if there's a circumstance in your life right now that you're looking in a weird way, <laughs> that you're looking in a wrong way, that maybe God has placed that circumstance, that storm, that difficulty in your life because there's something that he wants to do in you and through you in that circumstance. Maybe he brought that circumstance to you because you're the solution to that difficulty that you're going through. Whoa, have you ever thought of that? You might be the solution that God has sent for that circumstance. How cool is that? God thinks of you so highly. He says, you can fix that problem in school. You can fix that problem in your family. You are the solution to that situation. If you have the right attitude, you look at circumstances so differently. Amen? Amen. We'll work on that. We'll work on that. Thank you. That was very comforting and somehow not really there. Third attitude, people, circumstances, and this could be for some the most difficult one. Your attitude towards the church. Your attitude towards the church. 
you know, I have no idea what time I'm supposed to finish. This is like my almost last point, but I can make this go on for an hour because this is what I really love or, or yeah, all right. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, how many would give me 10 more minutes? So you can, if you finish in 10 more minutes, that's good. You give me 10 more minutes. Keep your hands up for a moment. I need to count 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. I got an hour, that's fine. I'll be good. All right. Third one is the church of Jesus Christ. Except that sometimes we feel like some people have hijacked the church. Do you ever get that feeling? That, you know, some people... Some generations, some mm, difficult people, they've just hijacked the church of Jesus Christ. It's supposed to be the church of Jesus Christ, and, and, and yet it doesn't seem like it. And sometimes our attitude towards the church really stinks. Sometimes our attitude towards the church of God really stinks. You know, church is still... God's secret weapon of changing Stockholm. The politicians are not going to do it. The artists are not going to do it. The important people in important places, the business people, they're not going to do it. But the church of Jesus Christ can change Stockholm. Hmm. There are some people who believe here, but I'm wondering about here. I didn't, I didn't hear here. Did you know that Jesus wants to come to Stockholm? Did you know that Jesus wants to change this city? Where there is poverty, where there is problems, where there is depression and discouragement and people living on the streets, Jesus would like to come into this city and set it free so that the artists can be free, so that the businessmen can be free, so that all those high-level politicians can be free to complete their task in Jesus Christ. And the secret to changing the church is not, uh, to, to, uh, changing the city is not more money or more people in high places. The secret to changing the city of Stockholm is the church of Jesus Christ. Fantastic. I just need to, I, I think I need to just give some opportunities, you know, for people to respond and, 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 and they will. Uh, church is God's secret weapon. And it's just one day they're going to say, we never saw it coming. <laughs> it was Philadelphia. You know, who would have thought? <laughs> Great history. And, 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 and people were already counting down the days to when they cannot keep the doors open anymore. And people were already counting out, you know, it's, uh, mm. but then he found a generation that started looking toward Jesus and started changing their own attitude and started seeing the potential and the possibilities in the church of Jesus Christ and they changed their attitude and amazing things started to happen. Amazing things started to happen. Uh, yeah. Jesus loves his church. And let me be clear with you, there is no perfect church. Sometimes the grass seems greener on the other side. It could be. <laughs> I mean, who knows? It could be. But if God has planted you here, this is where the grass is going to grow for you. This is where you're going to help it grow for God's kingdom. I believe strongly in churches coming together and changing the city together because we all need each other. But I do believe in being planted and rooted in a church because if you're constantly trying to hop and find another place and find it doesn't feel, oh, the, well, there, uh, and you know, your roots never get deep. Ooh. And then when the storm hits, you don't have the deep roots and you fall. So stay planted where God has planted you. Find your place and stay there. And change your attitude towards the church. Um, do I have a, is it okay if I borrow a piece of paper? You know this by heart now. 
If you don't, I can read it to you. Jesus come till us gav us frihet. Tog den plats som var vår. När han dog för oss. This is actually, you haven't sang this yet, have you? You did. You did. I, I missed it. Completely missed it. I was thinking about the sermon. You sang it already, so I can use it. Okay. This is an illustration that I sometimes use. Um, we were living in Australia, and I was flying back and forth to Indonesia. That's where I am. You know, Indonesian is my second language, and that's where I, that's where I you know, visit. I go to the churches. I encourage them. And this one time, I had been able to take my entire family with me to Indonesia. And so we had flown there, been there for three weeks. I had ministered. My, my uh, children had visited with their old friends, and, and they had a great time. And then we came back, and we were in Sydney Airport. And... Uh, <clears throat> Let me give you the backstory for that. Um, in, in Australia, they keep 6% of your paycheck and they put it in some kind of a retirement fund. Do they do that in Sweden as well? They take a part of your money and they invest it somewhere and then when you get to be 65 or 66 or 68 or 70, they keep pushing that boundary. But you know, one day they say that they're gonna start paying you back. Do they have that retirement system as well in, in Sweden? Okay, that's what they did in Australia. 6% of my paycheck was, was withdrawn. After about two years, I started wondering, I wonder where is my money? You know, where have they invested my money? You know, the, 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 the uh, financial crisis was hitting. This was 2008, 2009. The financial crisis were, was hitting the, the world. And my, you know, I wanted to know where my money was or had they lost everything. So I call this place, you know, that they, every month they sent a report. And they, you know, I called this place and, and they answered there. And I said, hello, my name is Mika Uriela. And I am from Canberra, Australia. And I would like to know where is my retirement money? And I spoke English with a little bit of a Finnish accent. You know, rally English, you know, it's, you know, our Formula One, Kimi Raikkonen, and he speaks great, 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 Finnish, great English. You know, and, and, and uh, we train them. They go through courses in university to learn how to speak rally English. And, and uh, all of our athletes do that. And, and, uh, <laughs> And so, so this guy, so this guy says, oh, oh yes, sir, um, um, yes, we have your funds. I see here that we have invested them in, in, in uh, various different funds and companies and things like that. And would you like to have a, 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 a statement of where your money has been investment? I said, yes, please. And so they send me next week this thick envelope, thick envelope, thick envelope. And I open this envelope, and they say in a cover letter, Dear Mr. Urila, you asked last week, blah, 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 blah. here is how we have used your money. And then the next 46 pages was full of nonsense that I couldn't read. I had no idea what it meant. But it had these lines of, of different I thought were companies and they had how many dollars I had invested and how many shares of each of the companies I had in that company. How many shares I had, how much money I had, how much my retirement had been invested into that company. And, and I started looking at this as I, I have no idea how to find out. So I went to Google. You know, yes, we had Google 10 years ago. We had it. Thank you, Jesus. You know, whenever you don't know how to, what to preach, you always go to Google. They help you all the time. <laughs> Sermoncentral.com, great site. And <laughs> this is one of the top right now. <laughs> so I took these three letters. Each line had three letters. And I took these three letters and I put them in go Google. And, and, and there was like a BBG. It didn't say anything to me. But I put it there and, and, and all of a sudden it found out, well, BBG is Billabong. You know, the surfing, the clothing company. And I realized that, man, I own Billabong. <laughs> I'm the owner of Billabong. It completely changed my mind and my attitude. See, before that, I always had, when I had saw, seen a guy walking at the mall and he had this big Billabong shirt, I had always chuckled to myself and thought, you know what? <laughs> That's a stupid guy. I had put $75 into that t-shirt that he could get in Indonesia for $1. What a stupid guy. You know, that was what's going on in my mind. I hope that I never said it out loud. Sometimes I do, accidentally, but, but I, I hope that I had never. But that's that's what was going through my mind when I saw people with Billabong shirts. Amazing thing happened to me. 
it changed my mind. When I realized that I owned Billabong, mm -hmm. that I was a stakeholder in Billabong, I kid you not, the next time, the next day at the mall, I saw this guy, you know, this Australian surfer dude with long hair. He was just walking all casually, and he had this huge billabong shirt on. I looked at him, and I smiled, and I actually, which is not typical for a Finnish person, I actually said something to him. I said, that's a really cool shirt. <laughs> What changed the fact that I knew that that guy had just put money into my retirement fund? <laughs> that guy had purchased something that I had made. He had made me some money. Thank you, sir. It totally changed, you know. And, and there, there was time, things after things that when I realized that I owned this thing, that, that you know, it's... It, so we were coming home from Indonesia. We were at Sydney Airport. One of the companies that I had found out that I own is called Macquarie Airports. And I had no idea what Macquarie Airports was. I thought there was an airport in Macquarie and that I owned it. But no, Macquarie Airports is actually owns five different airports around the world. I realized once I started reading into the company that I actually own the airport in Mexico City. <laughs> I own the airport in Brussels. I owned a portion of the airport in Copenhagen. I owned the airport in Sydney. And that was a big cha game changer for me. See, we lived in Sydney and, and, and uh, uh, we lived in Canberra and we would always, whenever we had guests coming in or we had to drop somebody off, the closest airport was Sydney Airport. So we had to drive there two hours. And once you get there, you know, they have this terrible thing where, you, you know, it's, it was back then, 10 years ago, $7 for parking for 15 minutes. Seven dollars for parking for 15 minutes. I was, always, I was always angry when I had to go to Sydney Airport. I was like fuming before I was even going to the airport. I was fuming on the way there. And when I parked my car and I looked at seven dollars for 15 minutes, I was like, that is crazy. There was a Finnish hot blood that started coming out in me. And I was like, Ugh. There's something wrong with these people. They're, they're not fair. That's not good for the people. And, and I would, as soon as I could get people out, you know, I would throw them out, you know, and, and if I had to wait or the plane was delayed, I was angry by the time guests arrived because I had had to wait there for an extra 15 minutes, pay another $7. <laughs> Once I found out that I owned Sydney Airport, <laughs> the next time I was dropping some passengers off in Sydney, I actually parked my car, I looked at the sign, and I smiled, and I thought to myself, you know, they could just make it an even $10. <laughs> because I realized it was, it, was, it was coming to me. You know, previously, when I, was, when I was walking in the airport and I was having a coffee cup, you know, a coffee there, I was, you know, and, and I didn't have a trash right away there, I would just leave it where it was, you know, it didn't matter. Once I found out that I was the owner, of the airport, I would find other people's cups and clean them out and take them to the garbage because it was my airport. So we were coming back from Indonesia one, after, one afternoon flight and, and we were standing there and my family had gone to the bathroom and there was a guy who, had, who was come from the same place, a plane, he was an Indonesian guy, he looked like Indonesian, he was coming from the same flight and he was walking by me and in a very casual manner he had a piece of trash in his hand and he was just walking straight by me and he, he completely, as he walked by, he just you guys, you missed it. You, you didn't see it. He walked right by me. And as he was walking right by my, he did what Asians would do in Indonesia. You know, there's no trash cans anywhere. They don't, you know, they wouldn't think about it. They just throw the trash wherever it's convenient. So as he was walking by me very casually, he just dropped the piece of paper. Now, please, you guys are not seeing this. I'm trying to illustrate. This is a great illustration. Please pay attention. I have a piece of paper in my hand. As he was walking by me, he just dropped the piece of paper. Did you see it? Okay. And I looked, I looked at the piece of paper, and I looked at the guy who was walking there. And of course, I was about to go and pick up the piece of paper, but then I thought, aha, uh -huh. 
if I go and pick up the paper, the next time this guy comes to my airport, he's going to do the same thing. So I did, again, a very untypical Finnish thing, and I ran after the guy. <laughs> And I tapped him on the shoulder. He was on the line to immigration already. And I tapped him on the so shoulder and I said, hey, in Indonesian, hey, I think you dropped a piece of trash back there. In Australia, in public places, we have to find trashes to put them. I'm sure you didn't understand and stuff like that. And, and he was a young guy. He was very polite, probably about 17 or 18. He was really polite. And he said, I am truly sorry, sir. I am, I'm, I'm really sorry. And he went and he picked out and put it in the trash. Now, I was a little bit disappointed in that because I had kind of hoped. This is how it plays in your mind. You know, you, you, play, you imagine a situation in your mind, and it never really happens the way you imagined it. But I had imagined this going a little bit differently in my mind. I had imagined that I go and I tap him on the shoulder, and he got, looks at me, and he's got this attitude on his face. And when I say, I'm sorry, sir, but I think you dropped a piece of trash back there. We can't do that. In Australia, you know, that's not how we do things here. I had thought, this is what I had imagined in my mind, that he would look at me with an attitude and said, who do you think you are? Like, do you own this airport? Because <laughs> I had imagined it going a little bit like, well, actually, <laughs> now that you say, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did you know that the church, church's main job is to expand God's kingdom, the kingdom of Christ? But then there's this awesome thing there that says this. And you, y'all here, are co-heirs with Christ. Which means whatever Christ inherits, you will inherit. However much the kingdom is expanding, however much you expand the kingdom, someday that's going to be your retirement fund. One day, that's going to be something that you are going to inherit. And this changes your mindset because all of a sudden you start picking out trash around there because this is my church. This is my kingdom. This is my thing. But it also starts affecting that if you hear some other churches doing amazing things and victories in Christ, you don't start saying, oh, well, they're wrong. And that No, you start rejoicing with them because they're just expanding your retirement fund. They're just doing something great for the kingdom of God. And someday you're going to be co-heir with Christ and with them in receiving the inheritance. Now that's a different attitude towards the church of Jesus Christ. People, circumstances, and his church. Let me just tell you that Jesus really loves his church. He really loves it. So be careful what you speak about it, whether it is your church or that church. Be careful because Jesus really loves his church. He calls it his bride. And I just, I don't know about you, but if you start talking bad about my bride, you know what I do? <laughs> you don't ever want Jesus. <laughs> so watch what you say about his church. His church is awesome. It's got flaws. Some parts are still a little bit being perfected. But his church is awesome. And you are making it more awesome. Would you just bow your head with me for just a moment? I'm coming to a close. Now, if there's something in your mind you feel like, you know what, I have, I have done, my attitude has been a little bit rotten. There's this guy, there's this girl, there's this situation, there's this problem, there's this church. And you know, 
I think God was speaking to me tonight. I think he wanted to correct something in my heart tonight. I'd like you to respond in a way. I'd like you to just respond to Jesus by saying, I'm sorry. If that's you, if you felt like there was a prick, this message was probably for me. I mean, I know it was for my neighbor, but I think some of it was for me too. I'd like to just pray for you. I would just like to pray for you so that maybe you'd get a new set of glasses on your head. Maybe you'd get a new set of a way of looking at things, a different attitude towards the things that you're going through, the churches, and towards the people around you. So if that's you, and you felt like, you know what, that was for me, would you just put your hand up wherever you're seated, uh, just so that you're confessing to the Lord, Lord, that was for me, I'm here, you see my hand, you see my problem, you see, you see what I've been battling. Just put your, keep your head, hand up for just a moment. Anybody else here still saying, you know what, God was speaking to me tonight. That's good. Let's put our hands down. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we want to thank you for the amazing thing that you are doing. We trust and we know that we know that we know that, Lord, you who have begun a good work in us will make it to completion. You who have begun a good work in my friends, in the people next to us, the people around us, you are the God who will see it to the end. You've begun something good in them and you're gonna finish it. You've begun something good in this church and we thank you for it. You've, you've begun something great in my heart, in my life and I thank you for it. Lord, I'm in the middle of a situation I cannot see but I'd like to see it from a different perspective, from your perspective. Lord, maybe I'm going through this so that I can grow. Maybe I'm going through this so that I can just be closer to you or become more like you. So. Jesus, in this place tonight, please forgive me. Clean my heart. Clean my eyes. Change my attitude. Help me to see things the way you see things. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said...